Hi, how y'all doing? Uh, welcome to our show. My name's Tyler. I'm the Vice President of the Winthrop College Republicans. And I'm Polly Morgan. I'm the Executive Director. And today with us we have uh, Mr. Chad Connolly, who is uh, running for Congress. Um, he is the former State Party Chair of the South Carolina Republican Party, and he is the Director of the Faith Initiative for the RNC. So thank you for coming out today. Well, Tyler, Polly, thanks for having me. And mm -hmm. I'm really proud you guys are involved. I, I went all over the state when I was chairman went to every college Republican group at every single college trying to recruit people like y'all. So I'm very proud you're doing this. You know, I've been working on building the party for a long time, and uh, my prayer, my dream was to have the Tylers and the Polys come out of nowhere and get involved, and you're doing it. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate that. Um, so, so talking about the party, how did you first get involved in the, the South Carolina party? Uh, you know, the long story, the short story actually is uh, as a freshman at Clemson, uh, I was in ROTC. Uh, my dad had had some struggles with uh, downsizing his company, and I had to help pay my way through college. And so one thing I did was join the National Guard and Army ROTC. Running around campus that first semester, it was only six months after, I mean six years after Vietnam, I remember being booed, um, you know, warmonger, baby killer. I was like, I wasn't even in Vietnam. I can barely spell it. You know, are you kidding me? <laughs> and uh, six or eight months later, the same people that looked like getting cheered. And, you know, USA, USA. And it really made me stop and wonder what happened. And I recognized it was Reagan's message. You know, he always had a sunny optimism about America. He always had, had a, a sunny optimism about his patriotism. He never apologized for his faith, his, his belief in America, his conservative ideals, and certainly never apologized for the country, yeah. like what we've seen. And so mine and Michelle, met a girl named Michelle, fell in love, got married. Our response was we wanted to give back. We recognized that America has done something no nation in all the world history's done. Created more freedom for more people with a system of government and a stable constitution like nobody else. And so our response was to get involved in politics. Not officially, but knocking doors, making phone calls, waving signs. My boys came along in 97 and 2000. I ran for state senate in 03 and lost. But I really felt like it was about being obedient to what I felt I was supposed to do, not necessarily about winning. Uh, my wife passed away in in 06, I uh, found myself a single dad with two little boys, and, and she committed suicide. It was one of those things you don't wish on anybody, and, you know, it's horrible. Uh, but, you know, the Lord brought me through it, and I met a great girl, got remarried, got right back involved in the party, um, just doing local stuff. I was county party chairman in Newberry, yeah. set a record for a um, number of precincts that we organized, and I did that, of course, very hard when I was state party chairman, recognizing that with a two-party system, if you want to fix a country, if you're frustrated, like a lot of people are, it, this is the place to do it, yeah. is go fix it, go get involved. And let's face it, the pendulum swings, but the pendulum swung so far to the left for the Democratic Party, they're not coming back for 50 or 100 years. Yeah. So if you care about core issues like conservatives do, you better get involved in the party. So I ran for state party chairman in 11. I got elected, got reelected overwhelmingly, like 76 to 14 to 10, but who's counting, <laughs> uh, in my reelection in 2013. And I, I just love the party work. I just think this is where it's at. Uh, you know, my dad always said people get involved in something. You sure ought to be involved in your church. You ought to be involved in your family's lives. But people find time for something else. And I think this is the one of the things that people that care about the country, they ought to be involved in the party. So then how do you, how do you go from, you know, party member, party chair, to now wanting to run for Congress? Well, you know, I, I, I can't tell you this was a dream of mine to do. I love Polly said, this is my dream. It's my dream job. That's really admirable. Uh, look, um, I lost a wife ten and a half years ago. I met a girl who was also widowed by suicide. I've watched God work in my life. Uh, it's just not any more complicated. And uh, I've learned, you know, you really just want to walk in obedience. Uh, we prayed about it. Uh, we prayed a long time. And my mom passed away. And so in that reflective time around Christmas, trying to help my dad get through the grief, uh, you know, it gave us a chance to really think about it. I, I think that I believed if I ever did this, I'd have a year to prepare, you know, plan, process. Yeah. And God's sense of humor, I had a month. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Look, I've, I've loved what I've done for the RNC. You know, I'm in the process of separating from them, obviously. Uh, I love Pat, talking to pastors. I love being around the country. I just think that we don't, you know, just need to have an R vote. We need to have a solid conservative R voice, a Republican, a conservative, and, and honestly, a Christian, uh, to get our country back to where it ought to be, to what works and gives results. And so this wasn't a dream of mine. Uh, I, but I do want to be obedient. I believe that I've been called to go do this. Speaking of faith and Christianity, how will your experience with the Faith, faith Initiative help you as a congressman? Can you also explain what the Faith Initiative is? Sure, sure. Give you a little background. So, uh, Reince Priebus, the chairman who's now chief of staff to the president, we had gotten close. Um, uh, he 
he saw me do the TV shows. You know, I did every political show on television in the 2012 election for the presidential preference primary. And he would see me on MSNBC and text me, hey, nice job. Way to defend your faith. Thanks for standing up for the party, stuff like that. And that was our relationship. And I'd see him at the RNC meetings, and we got to know each other, prayed together. Um, I found out he's just one of us. He's a great guy. And then when we were putting together the 2012 election, my donors knew we were going to win. And so I had a donor challenge me, uh, what are you doing to help Romney win in other states? And I said, well, I'm raising money to send volunteers. And I think we had actually 1,400 people that went to eight battleground states to help Romney win in battleground states. We even funded 110 cadets from the Citadel in Charleston to go to two, pre or two districts in Virginia. And so out of that, I was vested. <laughs> yeah. And so I go see rights after the election. Man, how do we lose to Barack Obama? He's the worst train wreck of a disaster ever foisted on the American people. And um, I, I said, we left out the faith community. We, we ignored it. You know, not, we didn't spend a dime in Catholic, Jewish, Christian, evangelical circles at all. I, I, I was in meetings where I knew the political strategy was, oh, the base is going to come out. The Christians have nowhere to go but vote for us. And I won't be more specific and give the guilty names of who said that stuff. <laughs> but, the, you know, I sat in those meetings. They assumed. I said, right, I've been talking in churches for 25 minutes. Let me talk to them. And, and I mean, I was just being rhetorical. I wasn't, I was running for re-election, and I wasn't looking for a job. Uh, I turned him down in April because he wanted me to live in D.C. I said, hey, man, I'm not moving my kids to D.C. You know, you know our situation. We're both widowed. Mm -hmm. Our kids need to be around us. We need to be in South Carolina. Yeah. And um, he called me back after my re-election in May, and he said, look, you're an odd duck in this deal. You love the Lord. You understand the political process. I want you to run this. I want you to be our first ever. Call it what you want. You can live in prosperity. Mm -hmm. So candidates and campaigns had done this. No political party had. And um, I went all over the country, been to 40 states, spoken to a little over 80,000 pastors, rabbis, priests, faith leaders, and anybody who'd stand still. I think the way it helps me is this, is I've listened to more people from more places, from more backgrounds, from more diverse ethnicities, denominations, viewpoints and angles than, than I dare say anybody. In fact, if you know somebody, Tyler, who's been in more hotels and been on more plane flights than me in the last year or three years, let me meet them. I'd like to shake their hand and say, God bless you. <laughs> Um, I've been everywhere, and it's given me a chance to listen to the American people. You know, the heartbeat that I think Mr. Trump tapped into is people are mad. They're frustrated. They're sick and tired of both parties saying one thing and doing another. And here's the other part about it is, what is it, 1,035 seats in the last eight years went from Democrat to Republican at the state and the federal level? That's unheard of. It's unheard of. It's unprecedented in American political history. I think people not just have a chance now or have a right to insist upon conservative reform. They're, they can demand it because they know what works, and they sure know that big government intrusion doesn't work. I, I think i got a perspective that not many people have, and I think that will help me in Congress. And, uh, you know, honestly, I hope there's not a thin dime's worth of difference between me and everybody else on policy. There probably will be. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we don't just need a Republican vote. We need a reliable conservative voice. Yeah. I think I'm the one that can do that. So you mentioned policy. So what are some issues that are important to you? You know, I've been talking about term limits for years. Uh, D.C.'s broken. I used to think term limits were elections. And then you see that people, it's the same thing the founders thought. You know, when you go back and read, and I've read hundreds of books on just the American founding and Christian history. And when you go back to the original sourcing, I know the left likes to hit me because I wrote a book about this. And, but David Barton's been one of my mentors. Uh, Marshall Foster, I've done tours of D.C. and Boston and Plymouth Rock and Philadelphia with those guys original sourcing. You find out that the founders never intended for career politicians. They intended that somebody would step out of their home business, their family business. They would go sacrifice and serve for a time. Well, you know, God bless the people who've served 30, 40, 50 years, but we've had enough of career politicians. People are sick of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have any desire to be up there very long. This wasn't a dream of mine. I think we need people who, you know, I've had my own business for over 20 years now. Uh, this is the first job I've had in 21 years, in fact, the RNC job. I work for myself, and I've spoke for a living. I've done contract work. I've consulted uh, because I believe it's somebody who just steps out of a small business and goes and serves in D.C. So term limits is a big one. Uh, of course, if you can go down the, the stuff. I mean, I'm a military guy, uh, so strong national defense. Border security is very important to me. We need to get rid of Obamacare. Uh, we obviously need to cut down on the regulations that are choking small businesses. We've got to create jobs. And if we do those things, lower the tax rate, cut down on the business intrusion, we're going to have jobs coming back to America just like the president says. I just heard one of the cameras ding. Oh, that one's fine. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, so 
you went on a tour called DC is Broken. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the tour, what you did, yeah. and what are some steps you're taking to fix DC? Well, and again, it's going to be the policy stuff. But the reason I want to do that was, you know, I've been blessed. I've been all over the state. Uh, when I was chairman, running for chairman, I, I went to every county at least twice in my run. I went to every county at least twice during my term. And when I ran for re-election, I went to every county at least twice, every county, all 46. Uh, so I have friends in every county. Mm -hmm. I have obviously have friends in every county who were the county GOP folks who served with me, who've watched me operate as a leader, as a chairman, uh, who've been buddies of mine, who helped me on things like school choice. And I wanted to honor that. Uh, so we stopped in, I guess, eight places in two days. Uh, my buddy who drove, we drove seven hours the first day and like, I don't know, four, four and a half the second day. And so we stopped in Sumter and then we went to uh, Rock, to Lancaster and Rock Hill, came down to Winsboro. The next day went to Chesney in the corner of the district and then to Gaffney, then to Union and back to Newberry. Uh, so, and we couldn't get everywhere. And the people said, how'd you pick those? Well, the people who said, I want to host you. That, that's how we did it. So we've got others coming up in Kershaw and Camden and more in Rock Hill and more in Fort Mill and Sun City and uh, Chester. We, gotta get, we went to Chester the other night. So we're going to be in every part of the district. I want people in the 5th district to know we're not going to ignore any part of the district. It's a big district. It's big yeah. geographically, and it's big in population and growth, obviously. So I want them to know we're going to pay attention to the needs of the entire district. I think that's great because, I mean, you, you, being a poli-sci major and you know, looking at this election, most of District 5, like about 60%, is in New York County and Lancaster, but, right. I mean, you can't ignore the other 40%. No. Um, now, the entire reason we're having this election is because Congressman Mick Mulvaney had to resign to become OMB director. Right. So what is something that he did as congressman that you'd like to kind of continue or build on? Uh, you know, I'm a conservative's conservative. And, uh, man, if you can live up to what Mick did, he, he did a terrific job. Uh, that'd be a dream. If I can just be half of the guy he and the, some of those folks are, then I'm going to be all right. Uh, but Mick was strong on the fiscal issues. He was strong on the conservative issues. You know, you, people would be hard-pressed to find a vote. They thought, man, that was wrong for a re conservative Republican. And so he picked up on a lot of things. I think he's doing a terrific job as OMB director. Um, but I think just carrying the conservative torch in an overall sense is what we're going to do. And, you know, we, we appreciate him, and, we're, you know, we're really looking forward to someone to carry on those conservative right. fiscal principles. Moving on to more of a personal part of this interview. Sure. What is something about you that not many people wouldn't know? <laughs> well, you know, um, I coached baseball for a long time. That's probably one of my loves. Um, you know, Michelle had passed away, and um, so I found myself a single dad with two little boys that had just really hard questions. And um, one of the things that I bonded with the boys over, because they saw, you know, they saw something nobody should ever see. You know, your mom, you know, killed herself. It's not a cool thing. And it was really, really hard. And one of the things, we were close, obviously, but one of the things I think that really helped is I was coaching my oldest boy then, and when he moved out of Dixie Miners into Majors, and I started coaching my little boy, uh, T-ball coaches pitch. And uh, so I just, I love coaching baseball with my boys. And now, you know, my oldest boy broke my finger throwing a curveball with me. <laughs> it's broken. And I just didn't catch it well. Of course, he's big. He's 19. He's at Clemson now. He's a sophomore at Clemson. Uh, but my youngest son is uh, playing high school baseball in, in Newberry. And, and I'm more careful with my <laughs> finger. But now you got an 18. But nobody knows that. You got an 18 week election ahead of so that's a curveball too. So I mean, just got right. always exactly. getting thrown at you. That's exactly right. Um, and er earlier in this interview, you talked about how you wanted to get as a uh, state party chair, you want to get the youth vote out there. Mm -hmm. So, what is your message to young voters? Yeah, I and mean, you, you guys and gals are the ones that have to pay the most attention. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you always hear the the leftists that are the millennials, but the truth of the matter is, uh, I think there's a lot of media hype. There are a lot of young people like you and you who care about the country, who are patriotic, who are God-fearing, who are conservative because they've checked out the issues. You know, liberalism is so uh, fluffy and nice and we'll take care of you and don't worry, free college. And But your logic takes over and goes, wait a minute. <laughs> Somebody's paying for it. That's insane. Uh, you know, I went to every college Republican group in the state multiple times uh, recruiting young people to be involved in the party. I speak in school choice groups. I've been to every homeschool co-op and group in South Carolina. I've spoken at every private, every Christian school, a lot of the Catholic schools, and a bunch of public schools, recruiting young people to be involved in America. And I didn't do it, you must be a Republican. I, don't get me wrong. I didn't say, you must be a Republican. That's not always the coolest thing. I did it from an angle of, your future matters. This ought to matter more to you than anybody else. You better be paying attention. I, I like to tell a story. Um, I remember when I bought my first car. I don't know how much time we have. I don't know go too far. but uh, And so I told my dad, I said, he said, I had a job. I was a janitor at a sporting goods place. And I cleaned toilets and 
you know, whatever, cleaned up cigarette ashes and trash and everything else and vacuumed and, and uh, I said, Dad, I need a car. He said, that's a fantastic idea. You do need a car. And uh, so I had to have somebody drive me to my aunt and uncle's who then took me to the place we worked. And um, I said, I need a car. So we went to the car dealer. It was a buddy of his from, you know, years ago, grew up with him. And uh, I said, that, this is the car I want. He said, that is fantastic. He said, now how are you going to pay for it? I said, well, uh, um, Dad, uh, you know, my best friends uh, down the street, uh, their parents helped them buy their first car. He said, they don't live with us. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I was like, well, <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what, I'll split the money with you. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll help you out, but you're going to pay for the car. And that's what I've done with my kids. I'm going to, because you're going to help me drive other kids around. I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest of four. I have four. You know, we're not, this is not a welfare program. <laughs> this is, this is, we're going to participate. I'm not going to teach you socialism. I'm not going to teach you the free ride. I'm going to teach you responsibility and accountability. So a sports fan, you better get a job. You better learn it. So all my kids have worked. Uh, my oldest son worked at the golf course. He's a chief weed eater. And um, uh, he had to get up and go to work early. Then he worked in a sporting goods, I mean, a, um, a boat and sporting place. Um, my daughter's been a nanny, and uh, she's tutoring now. My youngest son's working for weed eating, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, doing yard work. Uh, and my youngest daughter's only 14, so she hadn't started. But it's something we believe in and we teach. And, uh, you know, I think that's probably what helped make me a conservative, too. And uh, that's been my message to them is, boy, you better be involved in this. You, you better figure out that this is real. Uh, And when you get that first paycheck and you look on that check, I remember when I started getting mine, I worked at McDonald's, and you find out, who's FICA? Why did they get so much of my money? Where'd where'd my money go? Who took my money? Where'd my money go? I'd like to meet FICA and beat them up in an alley. (laughs) And you start realizing, man, it matters where this money goes. What do you do with it? Who's responsible for spending it? Who's watching who's responsible for spending it? And it probably made me a conservative, and that's what I've tried to do with the kids. And that's how I try to recruit young people to be involved because it matters. Well, thank you. I think a lot of us want to go beat up FICA. In the yeah, back. No doubt. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this interview with us. So we really appreciate it, and we hope you you know, have all the best on the campaign trail. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. Thank I'll be you. back, I promise you. Yep. Holly, thank you so much. God bless you.